Hey, good good morning, church. Let me uh, mention just a couple of things for us to be praying for uh, this morning before I get into the message God's put on my heart. Um, I, I know the cases are just um, really escalating as far as uh, active cases and, and even the death uh, rates going up high uh, in our area. And so I, I know that's heavy on everybody, so I want to pray for that. I want to pray for um, not only those who who are struggling and their family members with COVID nineteen, but I want to I want to pray for those who are fighting it, who are who are on the front lines. M- many of us are hunkered down at home, while uh, while our healthcare providers, our nurses, doctors, uh, all of those folks are fighting this on the front lines, and and they're spending all day around and then coming home and being with their family. So I want to ask the Lord to protect them supernaturally. Um, and, uh, and, and I want us to ask the Lord, what, what can we do uh, to minister in this time? It's very unique, and ask the Lord, how can I be a part of getting the gospel out in our community and across the world? So let's, let me pray for us, and then, uh, then we'll dig into some scripture. God, thank you um, so much, Lord, for technology and uh, us being able to use this to uh, connect with your body, the church family here at Halton, and God, I pray, I pray, Father, that um, that whether we're in our uh, living room or office or wherever we are right now watching this, God, I pray that you would bless each person. God, I pray that you would comfort them and give them peace. Lord, I pray for those um, e- even close to us um, in our community, in our church family, people that we know who've tested positive, Um, this week uh, for COVID-19. I pray, God, for your healing on them. I pray, God, that you would do what only you can do. I pray, God, that you would um, remove this virus from their body completely. God, I pray for all of those who are fighting this, um, spending a lot of hours, extended hours at work, away from family. God, really on the front lines, our nurses, uh, our doctors, Um, God, I pray, I pray for them, Lord, that you would keep them sharp, but also um, protect them from this virus. God, I pray that they they would not bring that home, that you would protect them and clean them. Uh, God, even as they step in the door, God, that that you would do a supernatural work uh, over their body. God, we know that you're so big. You can do that, and we ask you to. Um, God, I just pray, I pray for the church during this time, God, that you would focus our heart um, while we can't maybe get out and be the hands and feet um, of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would use us in new and unique ways to be an encourager, um, God, to, to, to share um, posts that would literally get the gospel spread to all of our friends on social media. God, I pray that you'd use us in ways that maybe you've never used us before. And God, we love you. And we ask you, Father, just to move even in times like this, that the gospel would go out to hearts that are sensitive and ready to hear about the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. God, speak through me today. Use this message to encourage but to challenge. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I know your week has been um, rather different, just like ours has. And since the governor said, stay home, uh, the Spinneys have, for the most part, we have hunkered down on Camp Zion Road, and uh, we are uh, spending time together. But I want you to know our staff are still working. They're working at home. They're, uh, they're calling people, especially our older members in our church. They're calling them and checking on them, and we'll be doing that uh, in the weeks to come. And so, uh, so, so things are um, still going on ministry-wise here, but they're, we're happening in, in satellite places in all of our staff's homes uh, throughout our community. Hey, if you've got your Bible, turn with me to Philippians and I want us to be today in Philippians chapter 2. I realized last week we got in Philippians chapter 3 for a little bit, or actually it was chapter 4, but I want us to dig in a little bit this morning in Philippians chapter 2. And for whatever reason, God has just put me here um, this week in this book. A lot of my posts have been out of Philippians, and, um, and so I, I want us to, to dig in there. Now, before we, we do that, let me, um, 
let, let, let's just talk real quick about how all of this has grabbed our attention. And we really are seeing things primarily from more of a physical perspective perspective or a physical viewpoint. We're watching the news, we're looking at posts online, and we're really kind of keeping our eyes uh, down here. I remember when I was a little boy, um, primarily my, my dad and I, we would deer hunt, and, and we were always kind of watching the ground level for deer. And then I remember my very first time to go squirrel hunting with my dad, and, and I'm looking on the, where I'm normally looking, you know, ground level, and he said, buddy, if you're going to see any squirrels, you got to look up. And so I would look up in the trees, and sure enough, that, that's where the squirrels were. Now, I want, I want to remind you of this. We can stay focused here on the physical and looking at eye level, but God wants to draw our attention. God wants to draw our eyes up. I, my prayer is that you and I would see Him in the midst of everything that's going on. When I was a little boy, I would lay oftentimes in my driveway in country place, uh, maybe during the afternoon or when the sun would go down at night. If it was the afternoon, I would watch those planes fly over and, and I would always wonder, what are those people eating up there in that airplane? I, I would almost put myself in that plane wondering what was going on above me. And, or, or at night, you see the stars on a clear night and how beautiful it is, and you're drawn to the majesty of God. And, and, and my heart, my eyes, my attention, everything was drawn up in those times. L let's allow the Lord to draw our eyes, our heart, and our attention up to Him this morning. So, so to kick this off, let me, let me read a verse um, in, um, in, in the book of Psalms, it's the third chapter, Psalms chapter 3, and it's um, those first couple of verses. David's writing this, and it's a difficult time in his life. Listen to what he says. He said, Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. M many are they who say to me, there is no help for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me. L listen to this, my glory and the lifter of my head. D David had his vision on his enemy that he could see. And God said, son, l lift your eyes up. I'm your glory and I'm the lifter of your head. And so church, I want us today to lift up and see God in the midst of all of this. And remember this, our joy is not determined by the circumstances that surround us. Our joy is determined by the one who indwells us. Not our circumstances that surround us, but the person who indwells us. So in Philippians chapter 2, I want you to focus in here. Let's look at verse 5. It says, Paul would write this. He said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess, listen, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I, I want us to see Jesus in the midst of all of this. And so as I read this just a couple of mornings ago, I was reminded of, uh, of, of looking up. It, it just seemingly that Paul is saying, hey, get your eyes off the circumstance. Remember what we said last week? Paul's in prison, and in, in prison, he's reminded about Jesus. He sees Jesus in the midst of his circumstances. So, so let, let's just talk about Jesus this morning. Let's just look at what the Bible says right here about who Jesus is. The very first thing that Paul says is that Jesus is royalty. 
Now, I know when we are introduced to Jesus in the Gospels, he's born in a manger, he's uh, born in a barn, in a stable. It doesn't look a lot like royalty. But Jesus is royalty. In, in verses 6 and 7, he already said that being in the form of God, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. So Jesus left heaven to come to earth. He, he was spirit and he came and wrapped himself in flesh. He is God in the person of Jesus and he comes here to this earth to wrap himself in flesh. And the Bible tells us all about it. You, you remember some of these things now in John chapter 8 when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. He made mention of who he was, not physically, but who he was spiritually. Listen to what he says in John chapter 8, 58. He said, as before Abraham was, I am. And at that moment, the Pharisees like, we've got to kill this guy. He's just committed blasphemy. He has just said he is God. Now, you remember back in Exodus that that was the name for God, that God told Moses, you go to Egypt and you tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses said, well, who am I supposed to tell him sent me? And, and God said, Moses, you tell him I am sent you. Now that was God's name that he gave Moses to tell Pharaoh so that Pharaoh would know that I'm not the God of yesterday. I'm not the, just the God of tomorrow. I am God. So listen to what Jesus just said in John chapter 8. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the preexistent God. We see it all in scripture. John chapter 1 tells us that the Word in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word uh, was, was with God, and the word, everything that was created uh, was created by the Word. Then in verse 14 of John chapter 1, it says that, uh, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld the glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Genesis chapter 1 tells us that in creation, the Bible says, as if God were speaking to himself, he says, let us make man in our image. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, the plural pronoun, let us make man in our image. Who's God talking to? Is this a Baptist committee and the creation committee in heaven? No, this is the triune God speaking creation into existence let us the father the son and the holy spirit and so when paul shows us jesus in philippians chapter 2 6 and 7 he says i want you to see his royalty he is the pre-existent god from all eternity past jesus is here and he's here in the flesh now i want you to see the next thing not only is jesus royalty but jesus is righteous verse 8 says this well, actually, the last part of 7, it says, but, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Now, Jesus came in the likeness of men. He came in physical form here to this earth, but there was something missing in Jesus. The, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 that Jesus sinned just like we, or Jesus didn't sin. Jesus came in the flesh just like we are, yet without sin, and we beheld his righteousness. Jesus came in the likeness of God, in the likeness of men, but he didn't sin like men. And so not only is he royal, but he's righteous. Now, all of this, Paul is showing us Jesus. Look, look what he says. Verse 8, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And so he's royalty, he's righteous, sinless. But then the Bible says that Jesus was our replacement, that he became obedient to death even the death of the cross. Now, Jesus didn't deserve to die because he was sinless. Pilate even told us, and in, in, told the Jews, I find no fault in him. I, I can't find any reason to crucify him. He's, he hasn't done anything wrong. 
But he steps into humanity. He steps into time. He's righteous and perfect. And he lays his life down for my sin and for yours. It's me who should have died on that cross. It's you who should have died on that cross. But Jesus became our replacement. He was obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Now look what else it says in Philippians 2. Look, look at verse 9. It says, Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. So not only was Jesus our replacement dying on the cross, but now, Paul says, God exalted him. He lifted him up. And we see Jesus from royalty to righteous to our replacement. Now we see him resurrected at the right hand of God. God elevated him. He exalted him. He breathed life into his dead body. He gave him life, resurrected him, emptied the tomb. Jesus ascended into heaven and he's seated at the right hand of God. I want to tell you that that brings us some peace in the midst of what we're going through because Jesus is still seated at the right hand of God. He's not wringing his hands He's not pacing the floor in heaven. He's not wondering what's going to happen. He's not worried about all of this. He is seated in a place of position, exalted by the Father, seated at the right hand. He's been resurrected, and now he's placed at the right hand of God. He was exalted by the Father. Look at the next thing. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Here's the promise that you and I have. And I know this has been on a lot of people's mind. I've had several conversations this week on the phone. Pastor, is, is this ushering in the return of Christ? Is all this that we're seeing and experiencing, is, is this what Jesus talked about in Matthew 24? Is this the beginning of birth pains? I believe it is. Because the promise that you and I have is that not only has Jesus been resurrected and at the right hand, but Jesus is returning. Jesus is going to come and remove his church off of this earth. You, you and I are going to leave here one day. Um, those who are dead at the cemetery are going to be resurrected. Those who are alive and remain are going to be raptured and removed off the earth because Jesus is coming again. I hope you believe that, and I hope what we're going through right now reminds you that that day is, is, is sooner rather than later, that that day could very well be right upon us. I don't say that to scare you. I say that because it's the truth of God's Word. The Bible tells us over and over and over again that you and I aren't going to know the day and the hour in which the Lord comes. We're not going to know when Gabriel's about to blast that trumpet and we leave this place. The Bible says that the Lord's going to come like a thief in the night. He's going to come, and if we were expecting it, uh, we would be waiting. But you and I should be working and waiting and watching for the Lord Jesus it's closer now than it's ever been before. And that shouldn't cause anxiety in us. That should overwhelm us with peace. In fact, in 1, Corinthians, or 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Bible says this, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ shall be raised first. And we who are alive and remain should be caught up together with them in the clouds. Listen to what it says, the last verse. It says, comfort one another with these words. If you are the church, if you've been saved, if, if you've, you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ, knowing that he's coming back should not cause anxiety. It should bring comfort to us knowing that we will not have to endure here long. You know, if it makes us afraid, if it causes us anxiety, we may not be ready for His return. We may not be ready for Him to come in the clouds and call us home. 
That's the last thing of this message that I want you to hear. He, Jesus is royalty. Jesus is sinless and righteous. Jesus has been our replacement on the cross. Jesus has come so that we, he died in our place so that we don't have to die as our sacrifice and as our substitute. God has resurrected him, seated him at his right hand, and one day Jesus is going to return. And if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, the last thing I want you to know is that God, through Jesus Christ, offers redemption. And when Jesus died on the cross for your sins and mine, he purchased the guilt of your sins by the blood that he shed on that cross. And he wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to know you. And he wants to live his life through you. Have you ever trusted Jesus as your Savior? I know that many of us this morning uh, have. But I believe that as this message goes out across the internet, I believe it's going to land in homes of people who haven't. You haven't trusted Christ as your Savior. You've not acknowledged the redemption of your sins by the blood of Jesus. Uh, listen, the Bible tells us there's two eternities. There's two places for us to spend eternity. It's not fairy tale. Heaven's not a fairy tale. Heaven's a reality. Hell is not some thing that Christians have made up. Hell is a reality. You and I don't go to heaven because of our goodness. You and I don't go to hell because we're bad. The Bible says that God's made a way for bad people to go to heaven. That's Jesus. Have you trusted in his redemption? I want you to think about this as we close. You realize there was a time that you didn't exist. I mean, if you go back for me, 44, nearly 45 years ago, there was a time um, in the early 70s I was not. I didn't exist. I wasn't alive when JFK was shot. I wasn't alive when Elvis died. I, wa I wasn't alive then. I was not in fact, just prior to my conception, I didn't exist. A hundred years before that, I was not. When Abraham Lincoln was the president of this country, I was not. When, when God, go even further, when Jesus walked upon this earth, you, you were not. I was not. When God formed everything that we enjoy, when he scooped out the oceans and he pushed up the mountains and he flung stars in the outer space, you were not. But I want you to know something. From that moment of your conception, there will never be a moment now that you will not be. When your heart beats in your chest for the very last time, you'll still be. At your funeral when folks gather, you'll still be. Once they uh, dig a hole and, 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 and put your grave marker there, your tombstone in its place, guess what? You'll still be a hundred years after your death. You'll still be. When God pulls those stars out of their sockets and the sun goes dark, you'll still be. You see, the question today is where will you be? Where will you spend eternity? There's two places. Jesus died on the cross to buy your sin, to redeem you from your sin. You can choose today to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You can choose today your eternity in heaven. You know, I shared with you last week, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Because of that sin, it separated us from a God who loves us. But Jesus came as the conduit. He came to, to, to bring us to God, to connect us to God through his death. And so you can trust in him today and ask him to step into your life, give you his grace, and to live with you all the tomorrows 
that you have. You say, preacher, I don't know how to do that. How do, how, what do I say? I don't know what to say. I want to help you with what to say. In fact, right there where you are, I want us to bow our heads together. And if you need to ask Christ for His redemption, if you need to receive His grace this morning, I want you to ask this to the Lord. Just pray something like this. Say, God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I'm lost. I know that Jesus came and He died in my place. And right now, I ask you to step into my life. God, give me your grace. Give me your forgiveness. God, I don't deserve it. But God, I'm grateful for your grace. And I ask you, Father, just to forgive me. God, step into my life. Walk with me. Live with me. And God, I pray today that you would save me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, listen, if you ask Christ to forgive you of your sins, if you receive that redemption that I talked about this morning, I want to know about it. That's a big deal. That, that's a, a major decision that you've made. In fact, you'll never make a bigger decision in your life. So if you made that decision, I'm going to ask you to do something. You can connect with us in a couple of different ways. You can uh, inbox us right here from our Facebook page and let us know that you made that decision and we want to encourage you and get you some materials and maybe get you your first Bible, talk to you about baptism and those next steps. Uh, maybe you can just send an email. In fact, you can send that email directly to me. You can send that email to gavin at fbchalton.org. Now, it's not Gavin, G-A-V-I-N. It's Gavin, G-E-V-A-N, at fbchalton.org. I would love to know that you said yes to Jesus. Hey, thank you for worshiping with us this morning at First Baptist Halton. We're praying for you, and God's going to get us through this, and I believe he's going to make us stronger than we ever were before. God bless you.